Borrow Trust, lessons learned building a Beyond Corp SSH proxy. Please give James Barkley a warm Torcom welcome. No problem. Um, so uh, my name is James Barclay. I'm a senior R&D engineer at Duo Labs, which is the security research division of uh, Duo Security. Um, and today I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, some of the lessons we learned building a Beyond Corp inspired SSH proxy at Duo. Um, so we have quite a few slides to go over, but uh, just to give you a quick idea of the agenda. Um, I'm just going to give a really quick update on like the Beyond Corp 101. Um, then we'll talk about a specific uh, aspect of the Beyond Corp uh, vision, which is the access proxy. And then um, I'll, I'll talk about how we we're able to uh, proxy SSH traffic through the, uh, the access proxy. And then I'll go over the client and server implementations of that. And then I guess if we have time, um, I'll take questions. Um, so Beyond Corp uh, is like a zero trust security model that was developed by Google um, that sort of re-envisions the, the idea of like a corporate network um, uh, being like perimeter based um, f uh, for access control. Um, so uh, rather than um, uh, you know, relying on uh, the network perimeter uh, to gate access to uh, your infrastructure and services and so on, um, they, it uh, shifted to individual users and devices. And uh, sort of the, the, at the core of the Beyond Corp vision, uh, there, there's the idea that, you know, the, these perimeters or walls don't work. Um, so, uh, yeah, like I already mentioned, <laughs> we, we, you know, we replaced trust in the, uh, in the network with uh, trust in the device and the user. Um, so, it wouldn't matter if you were, for example, working from a coffee shop or a plane or your corporate headquarters, you would get the same checks um, regardless. Um, so as an example, we'll say like to access the company lunch menu, which we don't really care about, uh, maybe you just have to have a managed device, which would be determined by maybe the presence of a certificate. Um, but to access source code or the crown jewels, um, you would need more than that, you know, not only to have a managed device, but maybe the, the latest uh, security patches and so on. Um, so Beyond Corp is a, a complex system. It's, it's been uh, discussed at length by, by Google, most notably in their uh, uh, research papers. Um, today, I'm just going to be talking about one part of it, which is the access proxy, which is responsible for gating access to uh, applications or uh, services behind that in, in your corporate network. So before I uh, get too far into this, uh, just some terminology, we'll, uh, um, I'll say that you know, in our case, the access proxy for us uh, was uh, a web server uh, running Nginx. Um, and it is responsible for authorizing and then proxying those requests to the back end uh, services. And a service, in our case, is just anything that sits behind uh, this access proxy. Um, so whether that's an SSH server, RDP, VNC, whatever. Um, and to give you a little more uh, clarity on that, um, the access proxy uh, is a, a web application that uh, determines whether a, a user is ac uh, authorized to access uh, a service. Um, and then the, uh, the, the reverse proxy, in our case Nginx, um, would uh, communicate with this application um, to determine if, that, you know, if, if the request should be uh, author or allowed to pass. Um, and then a service, um, in, in our case, was uh, basically a DNS name. That's how we identify it uh, in, in our back end. Uh, which has both uh, an, like an external name and an internal host name or IP, and then the access proxy is responsible for uh, determining what you know what services you have access to. Um, so uh, the the first thing that we decided to tackle when we when we um, you know went about uh, you know creating our own Beyond Corp, uh, sort of inspired by. Uh, by Google's um, was web applications. That's uh, arguably the easiest part. 
um, and in, in many cases is the, the most important. Um, for, for us, we had, a, you know, every employee uh, needs to access at least a handful of uh, web applications that are hosted on-prem. And we wanted uh, a way for our employees to be able to access those web applications without a VPN. So that's what we solved first. Um, and this is an overly simplified diagram, but I think you'll get the idea. Basically, we have external clients, or you know, maybe internal uh, in some cases, that just want to uh, access on-premise stuff, and the access proxy is what uh, uh, gates that access. Um, so ne next, I'm going to talk about the uh, authentication flow we used uh, to, to sort of uh, handle this. Um, so Nginx has a, a pretty cool feature called auth request. So this auth request directive can be used to uh, basically, like when a request uh, comes in to like Nginx, uh, it is passed on to a, a sub request. So our web application, uh, in our case, it's a Cyclone web app. Um, and uh, if that sub request determines that the user is authorized to access the service, so maybe they go through an SSO flow, they do a 2FA, whatever, um, then it returns a 200. And then Nginx uh, treats that as, uh, or it, it uh, treats that, uh, that request as authorized. If it returns a 401 or 403, it's denied. Um, and any other uh, status code is considered an error and access won't be allowed. So the, the application will check for the presence of a, a, you know, a valid session cookie for that particular service, so like wiki.example.com or whatever. Um, and if the user is authorized to access that, um, we return a 200. If not, we return a 401, um, and then uh, tell, which tells Nginx to redirect to like a login handler, for, exa for example, like if uh, you know, they just didn't have a, uh, you know, that, that cookie. And then once authorized, Nginx will proxy the request to the backend service. So uh, this actually, it, it, you know, it's simplified, but this is basically the gist of how you would configure Nginx as an example uh, to work with a, an application like this. We, uh, you know, point the uh, auth request to this slash verify handler, um, which is uh, an internal handler. Um, and uh, if that, uh, you know, request uh, returns a 200, then it's uh, Nginx will pass it along. If not, then uh, we, we actually set the value of this, uh, this variable here, for example, access proxy check, to the login URL, and then set the error page to uh, uh, that custom uh, login handler. So when it gets a 401, you know, Nginx will say, okay, this is your error page kind of like a custom 404 or something like that, but a little different. Um, so that, that's sort of like the, uh, the, the overall like architecture of like um, uh, this, how this is handled for web applications, but next I'm gonna talk about uh, how we solve for this uh, for, with SSH. Um, and why did we care about SSH? Um, for us internally, uh, it was really second only to, uh, to web applications. Um, and we really wanted to set our VPN on fire, so that's what we solved for next. And at the, at the start of this, um, we you know, had a few like, tenants that we wanted to stick to. Um, the first one uh, I mentioned here is that it must be easy to add new services that are behind the access proxy. Um, and that's something that Google stresses is pretty important in uh, one of the Beyond Corp papers. Um, another thing is we, we wanted, we didn't want to write our own like SSH, uh, y you know, uh, tooling uh, for like Mac OS or Windows, or, like for anything. Um, we wanted to use the existing tooling, um, but then also support uh, Chrome Secure Shell uh, because we do use Chrome OS pretty heavily at Duo. Um, and then this last one here, we wanted to be able to, excuse me, um, keep the exact uh, same authentication flow for both SSH and, or like any, any other protocol uh, in addition to uh, uh, web applications. Um, and so, uh, yeah, so we preferred to keep the, the same authentication flow, and then what enabled us to do that was using a browser-based authentication flow. 
Um, another thing that we thought would be, you know, that we uh, determined to be quite important with this was that the uh, the back end, like the SSH server or whatever, um, shouldn't know that uh, that, that uh, you, you know um, that traffic is passing through this access proxy. It should be completely transparent. Um, and uh, for uh, non-HTTP protocols, we were able to use WebSockets uh, to to make this uh, or to, to do this. Um, so this is from uh, one of the Beyond Corp papers, uh, Beyond Corp Part Three. Um, Google talks about wrapping SSH traffic in HTTP over TLS, and then they talk about this proxy command thing, which I'll get to in a bit. Uh, they call it easy. I generally disagree with that, um, but uh, yeah, uh, maybe it is for Google. Um, so when we were like. You know, trying to figure this out, we you know we we knew we wanted to uh, our we wanted our solution to work with Chrome Secure Shell. Uh, unfortunately, Chrome Secure Shell is is open source. We you know we knew about this like uh, uh, there's like this relay option uh, relay options text field. If you look at the Chrome Secure Shell, um, it, this this file in particular um, is responsible for for handling that, and it and it actually talks about Google's internal uh, HTTP to SSH relay. Um, and although Google, uh, you know, they say in this file that, uh, you know, the source code isn't available and we don't have any public relays, there's enough information here for you to probably, you know, create one of your own, which we wanted to. Um, yeah, and it, that, that was, that's an actual gif of my face when, uh, when I figured that out. Um, yeah, so, um, I, after this, I'm going to sort of talk about, like, the, like, behind the scenes how everything works, but uh, before we get there, I'm just gonna give you like just a quick idea of what it looks like for Chrome Secure Shell. So the user click connect. And the user would authenticate. And once we've determined that the user is uh, authorized to access that resource, we just re redirect back to the Chrome extension uh, URI. Um, and at that point, uh, bytes are uh, being tunneled through the access proxy and then passed on to the, uh, to the back end service. And all of that Nyan cat is, is going through the access proxy, all those bytes. Okay, so for Mac OS, for example, we just use you know, an ex uh, existing open SSH. Uh, user types SSH, user at whatever, um, like they normally would. We go through the, you know, so launch the browser, go through the exact same authentication flow that we do for, uh, for any of, you know, for web applications or for Chrome Secure Shell. Um, the user authenticates. And at this point, we actually um, redirect the, the credential back to a, a local HTTP server that we stand up uh, through that uh, that native like on-demand proxy. Um, that way, when we establish the WebSocket connection to that the access proxy, um, you know we're able to provide those credentials because it, unlike Chrome, Chrome OS, it doesn't inherit that because it's not a browser-based application. So, in a nutshell. Uh, the the this is like the the flow for Chrome uh, Chrome Secure Shell. The client uh, is a you know WebSockets client. Those bytes flow through the access proxy, and then we have you know the access proxy handles uh, taking that data and then passing it on to the back end. With uh, the native SSH tooling, um, we uh, you know I mentioned we wanted to you know we didn't want to write our own client, um, so we took advantage of this proxy command uh, directive in SSH. Um, that, that Google also mentions in uh, the Beyond Corp papers. Um, and then what that does is, um, you know, for specific hosts, for example, um, uh, it'll actually launch your on-demand binary, and uh, then you're, you, know, you can do whatever you want uh, with that traffic. Uh, it, it passes it as, uh, like, standard input to your program, like the SSH traffic. We tunnel that in WebSockets, um, and then, you know, it, it makes its way to the back end eventually. <laughs> Um, so this is, uh, you know, uh, 
somewhat simplified uh, like data flow diagram for like how it works with uh, Chrome Secure Shell. And then a slightly more uh, complicated one, but for, uh, for OpenSSH. Um, so as you can see, like the, the, it all starts with the, the user typing, you know, ssh at whatever.com. Proxy command launches our, uh, our external program. Uh, and uh, at that point, we, uh, you know, launch the browser, uh, stand up that local HTTP server, catch that authentication cookie, and then establish the WebSocket tunnel to the, uh, to the access proxy. And then the access proxy just tunnels those bytes back to the uh, backend service. So this Nash relay protocol, I mentioned the uh, um, uh, relay options in the Chrome Secure Shell, um, you know, w w uh, sort of like gonna go over like uh, what, uh, you know, how, how this works uh, in a nutshell, like what, what uh, the, um, uh, the handle is specific, specific handlers that you would need to implement in your access proxy to get something like this working. Um, so, like I mentioned before, like the, one of the cool things about implementing this uh, through the, uh, uh, or implementing the uh, NASSH uh, relay protocol is that it just works out of the box with Chrome OS. So WebSockets, um, what the hell are they? Um, so it's defined in this RFC uh, 6455. Uh, it's basic message framing layered over TCP, and it's designed for browser-based applications for uh, opening up like a persistent connection from, uh, you know, a, a web application to a backend without having to open up multiple HTTP connections. Uh, but one of the, the interesting things about uh, you know this using WebSockets and Google actually talks about this in, in the papers um, with SSH in particular, the the credential is uh, inherently portable. Um, but we, you know, um, whereas like, uh, you know, something like, uh, um, you know, we, we, we wouldn't be able to like, uh, for example, like tie a device identifier to an SSH uh, uh, certificate. Um, with WebSockets, we were able to just completely like separate the two. Like you, are you authorized, uh, is your device authorized? And then you can use, uh, you know, whatever credential, whether it's like a password or an SSH key, or if you're using an SSH CA, um, that, that stuff all just works uh, se completely separately from the device authentication. Um, so the w WebSockets actually starts out as HTTP. The, the client handshake is an HTTP upgrade request. Um, and then uh, once the, the connection is established, then messages are just passed over this, this persistent connection, just like a lightweight wrapper over TCP. Um, and both the client and server are able to close the, the connection by sending a, a, con a closed control flame frame that uh, you know, it just has a, a specific opcode that is understood by by the client. So this is what uh, an H, or I'm sorry, a, uh, a WebSocket uh, um, client handshake looks like. And then this is the server responding to that with a, a, an HTTP 101 switching protocols. And at that point, the, the persistent, persistent connection is established. Um, I'm not going to go over all of this here, but this is like the uh, what the uh, WebSocket uh, frame looks like. Um, we'll talk a little bit about like the opcodes, um, but most most of what we care about are you know what's actually in the payload, which could just be anything, right? And um, so I've mentioned NASSH. I just want to like uh, you know uh, go over this here. It's it's basically uh, synonymous with the Chrome Secure Shell. Um, if, if you look at the README, it, it, uh, it says that it's a Chrome app uh, that combines HTERM with a NACL build of OpenSSH. And so what's NACL? NACL is this uh, native client uh, that is supported in, in Chrome um, and that allows you to run like compiled C and C++ code in the browser. And HTERM is just an HTML terminal emulator. So uh, just sort of an overview of the, the NASSH relay protocol. Um, it's an HTTP to SSH relay, and it's supported in the Chrome Secure Shell. It defines a series of HTTP handlers that, uh, that if you implement in your access proxy, you'll be able to, to 
uh, you know, tunnel that, that traffic. Um, and then at its, at its core, it's, uh, it's just the, the regular old like SSH traffic with this custom uh, ACK uh, prepended to it. And then it uses uh, WebSocket binary frames as opposed to UTF-8 UTF frames, uh, with the exception of uh, there's a, um, an optional like ACK latency message, like the, the client is able to request uh, ACK latency from the server, and if you want to do that, then that one uses the UTF-8 frames. Um, so this is sort of, the, the, this uh, payload here, like the ACK, and then whatever, you know, the SSH payload, um, that would be contained within the overall WebSocket frame. Um, and then so this ACK, uh, what, it, what is this uh, ACKing thing that we're talking about? Um, the client and server keep track of the bytes that uh, are read and written. Um, and when the, the connection, the WebSocket connection is established to uh, uh, the, the access proxy, um, we uh, are, I'm sorry, the, the client uh, reports the, uh, the ACK in a query string. And then uh, what the server will do um, is uh, trim that, uh, this retransmission buffer uh, minus that ACK offset. Um, if it's a new connection, it, the, the, the client would just report zero for its ACK. And then this re retransmission buffer, um, this is also defined in the NASSH relay uh, protocol. Um, both uh, the, the server needs to keep, tra or, or will keep track of the bytes received uh, by the, the backend service. Um, and then we trim the, uh, the, that retransmission buffer whenever re we receive an updated ACK from the client. So when, when there's a new connection to, uh, to this access proxy, um, it'll be in the query string because it starts out as an HTTP request. Um, and then once it's the, the WebSocket connection is established, it's just that four byte um, uh, integer that is prepended to the SSH payload. Um, and then we, we use that to trim the retransmission buffer. So um, talk a little bit about the, uh, the server uh, implementation here. Um, just real quick, this is like the, these three lines you would need to add if you were using Nginx, for example, uh, to, um, uh, to your config file to support uh, WebSocket uh, connections. Um, and then uh, I mentioned earlier that we, we use Cyclone. Cyclone is just a, um, it's a Python framework um, that is uh, um, uh, built on top of the, the twisted Python framework. Um, it had, uh, it's a so it's a web application framework and it had support built in for using WebSockets, um, which was nice because we didn't need to add any additional dependencies um, to our access proxy code. Um, there was a minor modification that, uh, uh, that we needed to make uh, in order to get the binary uh, WebSocket messages working. Um, it's, yeah, it was just like four lines of code in, in a single file. Um, so these HTTP handlers that you would need to implement in an access proxy are defined in that NAS, NASSH Google Relay.js file. Um, there's five of them, uh, cookie, proxy, read, write, and connect. But we really only cared about uh, three of them, which is nice. Uh, it's less work. Uh, and the reason is read and write are uh, HTTP handlers. Um, and that would be uh, useful if, for example, uh, read and write, like as in like the, um, when we're reading bytes from, from the access proxy and then writing new stuff like from the client. Um, that would be useful if, for example, the Chrome Secure Shell you were using didn't support WebSockets or like for some other reason you couldn't use WebSockets. Um, but Connect is the single WebSocket handler, so we don't need to implement read or write if we're using that. So what does slash cookie do? Um, it, it handles uh, authorization and authentication and then we'll, we'll re redirect to the Chrome extension ID um, or localhost. Um, once uh, the user has, uh, we've determined that the user is authorized to access the resource, the user and the device for that matter. Um, uh, slash proxy, um, this handler, uh, if you look at the, um, the protocol in that, that file, it, it tells, uh, tells you that this is responsible for opening a uh, TCP connection to the backend uh, service. Um, so when we, you know, the client hits slash proxy, 
we just create a, you know, or open a TCP connection to the back end. And then we keep track of it by uh, just generating a UUID and then returning that uh, in the response body. And then slash connect is the, the actual WebSockets handler. Um, so that's what uh, we're, you know, what we use for bidirectional communication between the client and server. Um, so in the way, the, uh, what, what the client will do is it will have received the cookie from, uh, from the access proxy um, during the, the cookie step, um, and then it gets that UUID during the proxy step. Um, so then when it actually goes on to make the WebSocket connection, it uh, provides both of those um, so that the, the access proxy is able to say like, oh, okay, I've, I've, I've determined that you're authorized to access this resource and I'm, uh, you know, I've kept track of uh, that TCP connection uh, in the back end. Um, so next I'll talk a little bit about the, the clients. Um, the first one is just the regular old Chrome Secure Shell. That's what it looks like. Um, the, uh, the bit uh, like below user and example.com, that, that uh, text field, um, those are the relay options that you can use to, to configure Chrome Secure Shell to communicate uh, with uh, 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 an NASSH relay rather than making a direct connection to, uh, to the server. Um, and then with uh, standard SSH tooling, um, we wrote this local on-demand proxy uh, in Golang, um, and then we uh, point to that uh, using the SSH proxy command directive. Um, and then the, the local proxy itself uh, understands WebSockets, so uh, even though WebSockets was designed for browser-based applications to communicate with servers, it's of course not limited to that. Um, and then proxy command, uh, if you look at the, like for instance, like the, the documentation on it, it says that it'll take uh, standard output from SSH, like the, those, those bytes, um, and then pass that as uh, input to your program. And then you are responsible for displaying output back to the terminal by just writing to standard output. So uh, this is what the, uh, an SSH config file might look like to get this working. You have, uh, uh, you specify a, a, like a host, for example, um, and uh, uh, tell it to use a proxy command, in which we, uh, ours we cleverly called Nashville because NASSH. Um, uh, the host and port are just the SSH uh, ho um, host and port that, get, that automatically get passed uh, um, to the proxy command, um, and then we have this relay, uh, which I'll talk about uh, next here. Um, so a relay host, of, of course, we need some way to tell um, uh, the client, uh, you know, to, uh, to communicate with a specific access proxy, um, and the way, uh, uh, the way we do that is by, you know, providing it in that, you know, that switch there. Um, but but what, what's interesting about it is it's actually, we, we have a different uh, relay host uh, or like host name right for for every service that we put behind the access proxy um, and th the reason is uh, uh, it's actually kind of a shitty reason but um, there's a, a limitation in the the NASSH relay protocol where the first thing it does is it hits the slash cookie handler um, and you know you're responsible for like that's the only time you're able to determine if a request is authorized um, but we have no notion or like, or like no idea what uh, server the user is trying to connect to. So if we wanted to be able to say like um, have different policies for different servers, not just like, okay, you, you proved that you are uh, an employee at company X, um, you get access to everything. We don't want that. We wanted to be able to say like, okay, you have access to these things, right? Um, so, and the way we worked around that was by uh, you know, using a di different host name that just resolves to the IP of the access proxy for every single service behind, uh, behind you know, that we put behind the access proxy. And that way we're able to enforce and code like, okay, like this, this server and port map to this relay host and set policies accordingly. Um, I briefly mentioned a lo local HTTP server. Um, again, that was something that we, uh, we did uh, to catch the authentication cookie from, uh, from the server. So when uh, our local uh, on-demand proxy runs, it, uh, um, 
you know, launches the browser, hits the slash cookie handler, and then we uh, redirect to localhost on some ephemeral port. Um, and uh, that's, you know, that's used uh, for the remainder of the, the session. Uh, so now I'm just, I'm gonna go through uh, like sort of a step-by-step -step of how this all works with uh, OpenSSH plus this NASSH relay or whatever, this access proxy, right? Um, I'm not gonna go over uh, how it works with Chrome Secure Shell because basically if you get it working with both of, you know, with, with OpenSSH, it'll, it'll work with, any, uh, with the, the Chrome Secure Shell. There's not, they're not terribly different. We pass it a few different query parameters uh, in the local proxy um, versus uh, what Chrome Secure Shell sends by default. Um, so the first step, the user types their you know, SSH command. Um, proxy command uh, is going to uh, be responsible for, for launching our local on-demand proxy. So this is kind of cool too because we didn't want to have a, like, um, a, a daemon or something running constantly. Um, it's just, you know, it gets run whenever a, a, a new SSH uh, connection is, is established. Um, so the local proxy will open a browser, go to this URL, whatever, that, that relay host slash cookie, um, and then we have a few uh, query parameters that we pass in there. Um, and then once the, the user is and the device are determined to be um, authorized to access that uh, resource, we redirect to localhost. So this is different than Chrome Secure Shell, which we would redirect to Chrome dash extension, or you know, whatever the Chrome extension URI scheme is. Um, so next, the, the local proxy will uh, hit this slash pro uh, proxy uh, handler, which the server, um, once, uh, once it receives that request, is going to create a, a UUID um, and then uh, tie it to this, you know, whatever a session object, something that we can keep in memory to keep track of these connections. Um, and then we establish the, the TCP connection to the server. Um, so we, we keep track of the, uh, the connection in the session object, um, and then we have these callbacks that fire whenever we get new data from, from the server, right? And uh, once you know, you know, we're, we're done with that request, we return that session ID or UUID in the response body so that the client knows from now on when I um, you know, uh, m make these uh, WebSocket uh, requests use this, this session ID to identify myself. Um, so this is just a, a quick, uh, like, you know, like s sort of simplified uh, example of what that, that session class might look like. Um, sorry, not sorry if you don't know Python or hate it. Um, yeah, but basically we need, we need some way to uh, keep track of the uh, TCP connection and then, you know, to the back end and then the WebSocket connection to the front end. Um, and this is also where we store that retransmission buffer and then read count and write count, which are like used, they're, they're the, the ACK basically. So sessions, for example, we could just have a global variable and then when uh, a client hits slash uh, proxy, we'll create a new session object and then just tie it to that UUID. So uh, we're later able to look up that uh, connection when you know, the client will pro provide that UUID and uh, we'll, we'll you know, see, okay, you know, this session exists or it doesn't. So, um, slash connect. Um, so at this point, the, once the, the client has hit the HTTP handlers, um, and we, you know, we, we, we're determined that we're able to, uh, you know, authorize to access the resource, um, we start the uh, WebSocket connection to the, um, to the access proxy. Um, the server will respond with that switching protocols message um, and at this point, um, we just have callbacks that fire when we get new WebSocket connections or when we receive WebSocket messages. Um, and then like I mentioned previously, uh, the, the local like on-demand proxy will take uh, standard, in, uh, well, its standard input comes from SSH and then it passes that to the access proxy. And then the data that it receives, um, like the, the WebSocket messages that it receives, um, get displayed on the terminal. Um, we just uh, write those to standard output. Um, so when, when new WebSocket connections are made, 
we uh, look up that session ID that was provided by the client. And so during the proxy step, they would have gotten that. Um, during the, the, you know, when the WebSocket connection is made, they provide that. Um, so then we point to that, you know, I, meant I, I showed the, the TC, you know, whatever that session object, what it might look like. Um, we keep track of that. And then we update the read count and write count. Um, next, we trim this uh, retransmission buffer. Um, we, you know, the client will report how many bytes it's read. Um, so we can discard those, uh, the bytes that uh, it is confirmed to have read. And then we just uh, send a WebSocket message to the client with the contents of the retransmission buffer, which if it's a new connection, will just be an empty payload. Um, I'm not going to go over all of this here, but just you know, later if you want to look at these slides, if you're interest, interested in building something this, uh, like this yourself, maybe this will be helpful. Uh, but this is what, for, for example, what, a, you know, what you could do when a new WebSocket connection is made. Um, so now when we receive messages, um, what we do is we update this write count in that session object to the amount of, uh, or the length of the message, like how many bytes we received minus the four byte ACK. And then we just send the, the, the message that we receive, which is like the SSH payload, we just pass that on to the back end. But, you know, trim those, uh, the four byte ACK because that'll break the SSH protocol if we, uh, if we include some random 32-bit uh, uh, integer at the beginning of all of our SSH payloads. Um, and then we'll trim the retransmission buffer using that act that the, the client provided, um, either in the, uh, well in this case, uh, since it's, uh, receiving a WebSocket message, it's contained in the payload, um, similar to what we did when we got a new connection and it was provided in the query string. Um, so next, uh, yeah, again, not gonna go over this, uh, message received, what, what it might look like if you uh, wanted to implement that. This is when a new uh, WebSocket message is received on your uh, access proxy. Um, and then data received, uh, this is just like, so when I receive data from the, uh, the backend uh, service that, um, on that uh, TCP connection, I will update the amount uh, or the read count that, that we're keeping track of by the amount of data that we've received. So we're able to say like, oh, I've read this many bytes from the server. Um, and then we uh, can, you know, concatenate our write count with the, the data that we're receiving and then just send that as a WebSocket message to the, the front end or the, you know, to the client. And then here's what that might look like. Um, so other stuff. Uh, so th th there were some gotchas. Um, one thing we noticed was uh, the, the Chrome Secure Shell, um, when it receives a close control frame, um, it just, uh, it doesn't really honor it. Um, it'll just try to reconnect, probably by design. But if you want to permanently like close the connection, uh, the way you can do that is by sending an empty payload with a negative uh, ACK, um, or I guess probably any payload in a negative ACK. Um, uh, and then the, the next one here was uh, one that you know caused me to bang my head against the wall a couple times. Uh, the, the, the retransmission buffer um, seems to be useful mostly during uh, new WebSocket connections because we separate the um, that you know the the um, the step of like creating the TCP connection to the back end from the actual WebSocket handler. Um, so if you know if you've ever typed like Telnet, some SSH server 22 or whatever, you get back an SSH uh, version string. That's because that part of the SSH you know that that's how the SSH protocol starts out. The client and server exchange the version string. Um, <clears throat> so if we would have received that before the client had gotten a chance to send that to the back end. Um, we would encounter this race condition um, where the client would say, I'm this SSH version, and then the server would say, here's my key exchange list or whatever the hell it is, like the, the next step in the, the, the SSH protocol, um, which of course broke everything. Um, and that, that only happened when we were testing on uh, uh, like local VMs, like making an SSH connection to a, a VM running on our machine because, um, you know, uh, that we would get a response back pretty quickly, but you know, if uh, you know, for example, there were a few hops in between, um, that wouldn't happen. So the, the retransmission buffer is useful where we we know we haven't sent, uh, you know, the client hasn't seen that data. So uh, when 
the, the, the WebSocket connection is established, we just send whatever data we've already received, which in this case would just be the SSH version. Um, so I mentioned, you know, uh, RDP, VNC, like other things we might want to put behind the access proxy. Um, so how, do, how would we do that? So uh, obviously RDP doesn't come with this cool like proxy command feature that allows us to, uh, you know, launch an external program. I don't even know how that would work, but um, it, it doesn't exist. Uh, um, so what, what can we do there? Um, we've already tested this, so we know that um, it works if we just use like a, a socket. Um, for example, uh, rather, uh, you know, rather than an RDP client connecting to, S or you know, whatever, rdp.example.com, we connect to localhost on some ephemeral port and then have our proxy uh, handle tunneling that, th those bytes back to the, uh, or through the access proxy and eventually to the backend surface. Um, so that's, that's about it. Um, th these are some references. Um, if you're interested in building something like this yourself, um, th th these may be helpful. Um, and then this, this link here, um, I'm gonna make my slides available probably later uh, today. Um, uh, I haven't done that yet, but that, that bit.ly link is reserved. So beyondcorp-ssh-proxy. And that's it. Yeah. So, so right now, um, we the, like our we, we just actually have one, um, but but like, um, it, uh, you know, we, we've thought about it. We just haven't exactly like determined how we're going to handle that. Any other questions? Yeah, thank you.